for those who are here and those at home watching this service. A blessed new year. This is the first Sunday of the year and we wish you a blessed Sunday. Amen. We, as usual, being the first Sunday of the month, we actually have the Holy Communion. Uh, those of you watching at home, I hope that you have your elements ready. Those of you who have come in this morning, you all have uh, been given the cup and the bread in that plastic uh, cup, uh, the plastic thing. So we are going to start up with this uh, communion here. Bread in the Bible represents three things. It is not just physical bread. Uh, bread has multiple meanings. Remember the simplest of all when we actually think of uh, the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And give us this day our daily bread. It is saying to us that there is a continuous uh, coming to God for bread on a daily basis. And also when we talk about his bread, these are the three ways we look at the bread. First of all, the bread is Jesus himself. Jesus said in John's gospel, I am the bread of life. Another way we look at the bread is from a story in the Old Testament, but brought Jesus referred to that in Matthew's gospel, where he referred to that uh, table that is in front of the presence of God. And every 24 hours, the priest would uh, change 12 loaves of bread that were placed before that presence of God. And so that bread being continuously before the face of God is called the bread of His presence. And if we really come to understand what the presence is, then we, when we say, Lord, give us that bread of presence, is to say to Him that I want to be aware of Your presence in my life in a significant way, time to time. And that's available to us. So he, the bread is not just only Jesus, but His presence being manifest or made aware to us from time to time. And finally, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 30, 32, He says, My food is to do the will, or my bread is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. So bread there is doing the will of God. So these are the three things that we think about when we think of the bread. So let us come to the Scripture I hope you have your elements ready with you. And um, Let me read. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread together and let's thank Him. In the same way also, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let's drink the cup together. Let us pray. As we start this new year, we ask for that bread strength that comes to us for the spiritual journey that we walk and also the physical journey that we walk. There is a journey of 363 days or 363 miles ahead of us that we have to traverse in this year. Through many toils and dangers, we will pass. But we ask you that, Lord, your bread will sustain us, will keep us being able to move forward in your will, Lord. The things that happen around us only resolve, strengthen our resolve, our willingness to push on to do the will of God. May we partake of the bread of your will, Lord. Partake the bread of the will of God, like Jesus. That we will do your work, Lord, and we will finish, Lord. We thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. 
which we can enjoy, Lord. Forgiveness of sins, start a new life again. Start a new day for us. We need your forgiveness in order to know the newness of this whole year, Lord. All that is past is buried. All that is sinful, all that is wrong, shameful is buried, Lord. And we can look forward with confidence in the new year because of the blood that washes us. And we ask then you for sustenance, for food that will help us to do your will in this new year. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Some of you are aware that uh, congratulations are in order for our uh, brother Paul Pile and his wife uh, Mary Manadia. Da, not gone. Huh? Okay. No, all right. So, congratulations on the marriage of your son, Joash, to Joanne. So, we like to share that joy with you, brother. And amen. <laughs> marriage is a wonderful thing, right? Even if you don't get married, just watching it helps you. Why? Because the ministry of Jesus began with a wedding. And the ministry of Jesus, the last book of the Bible talks about wedding. When we get up there, it will be a wedding. So as I said some time back about what John Owen said, if you walk into a dim room and you see the shape of a low table, when you switch on the light, it won't be a coconut tree touching the ceiling, right? It will resemble something like the low table you saw in the dim light. Now we see through a mirror dimly about a wedding. We do not know what the real wedding will be like. But I am sure the joy, the happiness, the merriment, the sense of satisfaction, all will be carried forward to the new, to the final one at the book of Revelation when Jesus comes. So much about a wedding sermon. When I was asked for a title for this morning's sermon, I actually actually get the full title. It's like this, Coronation in the Time of Coronavirus. But then I may confuse people. So I shorten it to Coronation. And it says here that uh, the, the verses that we are going to read is from Isaiah 40, particularly verse 3, and then Psalm 110, Psalm 118, and the whole Gospel of Mark. Brother Moses, are you sane or not? I am very sane. I'm not going to go word by word or verse by verse or passage by passage in the whole of the book of Gospel of Mark. I'm just going to tell you the large picture of where Mark was going. So please relax. You won't be going through that whole exercise. Coronation it's a ceremony to crown the king. And the day is called the Coronation Day. The English phrase is Coronation is always associated with another word which is ascend or ascended. The way they say in English is he ascended the throne. Ascend means to go up higher than the rest because on that day, this man is recognized as higher than all other men. And all other people. That's the whole idea behind that. So that you will know that this man is different. So co coronation is always a very grand and elaborate affair. They have said that the British are one of the best in uh, what you call uh, what you preparing and executing a coronation. They have a thousand years experience. The last coronation of Queen Elizabeth II was somewhere in the 1950s. Some of us were not even born. And she, the organizers or the planners for that particular coronation day had something like 16 months or so to prepare it. And boy, did they do it so uh, lavishly. It really, everything is befitting a queen, a king of the realm. We know that there are coronation, what we call uh, references in the Bible, but nothing more. We, don't, we know very little how they actually do it. 
it, it is just like um, you walk into a, suppose uh, some big thing has happened to, uh, to uh, our land and uh, many years later, maybe hundreds of years later, some archaeologists come down to our Malacca town and they will walk into a motor mechanic shop. But they do not know what is it for. They see here a can of oil, they see here a hydraulic jack, and they see here some uh, spanners and some tools, hammers and tires and so on. But they, they do not know in our records there's a thing called a workshop. But they can say this is for this, this is for this. But if someone were to piece all together, they say this is a workshop. So the evidence are here, but we all don't know whether how to put it. So some people say a coronation takes place in the land of Israel uh, quite frequently as found in the Psalms. So there are 10 Psalms, that we, they all call them the royal Psalms because they refer to a king. There are many other verses that say God is king. That is found in 90, uh, somewhere in the ni Psalms beginning with 91. But this is not clear enough. Unlike these 10 Psalms, it has a very definite reference to throne to a king and what takes place. So, incidentally, and in those times, in ancient times, they keep calendar in two ways. One, there is a lunar calendar. They had to go by the moon because, uh, by the way, they count the months according to the moon, but they count the year according to the sun. This is our calendar as well. And so this kind of calendar is needed because following the moon is for the sake of harvesting. But they also keep another subsidiary calendar, which is connected with the king. And so you will read like stories in the book of 1 Kings chapter 15, in the year of King Ahaz, or the king this and King Jehoshaphat and so on. Because they count that calendar year from the day the king ascended the throne. And so when he ascends the throne, a new calendar, a new year starts. And so in this new year, right, there are two theories behind it. One, they say they, they have, uh, they have an and thrown the king once only during his reign. But there are other commentators who look at the Psalms and say, it appears like they celebrate it every year. So either way, both can have arguments for and against it. But let me just say this. Lah. If that is true, then we are saying that in this new year, we crown our King Jesus once more. Amen. We know that in the book of Chronicles and in, book, in the book of Kings and Chronicles, they have uh, uh, lines that tells us that there, there are kings that are anointed. King Saul was anointed. King David, Solomon, Jehu, Joash. But there is no mention of a ritual. They get the king anointed by the prophet with oil. Where you get the word christening or messiah or messiah, the Hebrew word. And it's Certain kings in modern times actually do not have secular people, but religious people to crown them, to anoint them with oil. Same, Britain, like I said, they have about a thousand years of practice. Sometimes it's anointed by the Archbishop of York or, Kendall or somewhere, but now the trend for the last maybe few hundred years, they have always asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to be the one that will anoint the monarch. But from all these things, although we don't see much mention of that ritual or that exercise, how they enthrone the king or how they carry out a coronation, we at least know that there are five features of the coronation. The first one is the announcer. There must be somebody like, uh, you know, nowadays, if you have television, that will be the commentator, commentator telling you what's going on. But in those days, they don't have TV, they don't have radio, they don't have newspaper, they don't have social media. What happens, a large part of the importance or the, the effectiveness of that coronation depends on this announcer. He will be standing up with a loud voice to tell the people what's going on. He may say something like this, Hey, everybody, prepare yourselves. Fall down to your knees. The king is coming. Something to that effect. 
And usually the announcer is accompanied with trumpets, uh, with string instruments, dancers, and even music, uh, and, and even army people as well, just to get the crowd to, at, to attention, to hear what is going on, and to even see that this king is coming. Secondly, as you can see there, there is the trophies of war. Because the, the idea behind that is kings were all warriors, and they have to show their supremacy by showing the spoils of war, that they have conquered this land, they have conquered that land, and therefore they deserve to be made a king. And the, what we will call credentials of a king. So if you, they have conquered, say, some parts of Africa, they will bring home you know, animals that the, that particular area has not seen. I don't know what are animals that are unique to Africa. Rhinos and giraffes and so on. Those kind of animals never found in their own homeland. They bring it. But many times they also bring the conquered army back, you know. Back, they will all be in chains. These were soldiers of the uh, defeated armies and they will be made slaves later on. And this is a whole huge parade in which the, the trophies of the war or the evidences of his victory takes place. And of course, the king does not walk. It is not befitting of him as a king that he walks. So he must be carried. There are many ways they, they can carry him. They can have a sedan chair carried by four men to lead the procession. They could have a horse carriage. The Queen of England, again, so sorry, I, because that's the most uh, familiar coronation that we all are, uh, are aware of. And so she comes in the, the I don't know, the gold, gilded, the uh, red colored carriage with horses drawn with his, her, her own army, all in costumes and so on. And very grand, yeah, very suitable for prime time television. Or he could come on a donkey or an elephant or a camel or a horse. In modern day, they will use the motorcade, eh, the huge uh, big presidential car or uh, royal car with uh, all the police uh, siren blaring away uh, and so on. So when people look at that, they will be in awe of this king because they've seen the trophies of the war. So the only state that has a coronation, although Malaysia, Malaya has nine royal houses, we have only one sultan that is having a coronation. You all may have read it, huh? If you, I don't know, five years, six years ago, the Sultan of Johor was coronated. The rest are all installed. Because Sultan of Johor, Sultan Abu Bakar, was given so called this privilege to be enthroned. And it, the first coronation took place in July 29, 1886. According to the newspaper, the people of Johor gazed in awe at the glittering crown and the regalia that was exhibited. Eh? We call it the trophies. And that was exhibited for the first time in the country. And this is how the newspaper reported. The people were all in awe when they see all these things. That's the whole idea. So that's the trophies of war. That's the vehicle that we have covered. As he approaches the place of enthronement, usually a castle, or in the old times like Jerusalem, he'll be entering Jerusalem because it's not just only the throne, the house of David, but also uh, the temple where that anointing is going to take place. And there will be some kind of a dialogue that will be going on between the pro people in the procession and people who are the gatekeepers. So before he reaches that crown or, or his throne, this gatekeeper and the procession members hold a little bit of a, uh, what you call, this kind of talk, yeah? They go back and forth. They'll ask questions or they'll say something. So one of the procession members will say in Psalm 119 verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. So inside the gatekeeper will shout, This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. And so on and so on. Then you think of Psalm 24, isn't it? Lift up your gates, lift up your heads, all ye gates, 
that the King of Glory may come in. So from the inside, they will say, Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of, of hosts, strong and mighty. So they go back and forth. They have a little dialogue, partly also to let the people know who is coming in now. This final moments or the final stretch of the procession, this is going to be clear who really this man is. So Psalm 24 is very grand, isn't it? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. The King of glory will come in. That, of course, is, a, is, is now looking back in a spiritual way that, the, that Jesus is this King of glory. The, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies is coming in. Mighty, strong and mighty. That's how you, you hear it. I won't go further to the rest of Psalm 118. We'll pick up at the, at the later part of the sermon. Then comes the crown. The king's crown is usually placed by the priest or some great personnel, personnel in the kingdom. Surely on that throne will be all the jewelry, the precious stones on the crown to signify the power and the wealth of this king. Then the last part, the throne. And the throne is always put on a higher place, as I said. That's how they say, he ascended the throne. Because on that day, he must be seen to be higher than all the rest of the men. That's why in democratic countries, we are all plain, we are all equal. But when there's a king, then the king must be seen as much higher than we all. And the gospel writers understand this coronation. Definitely Matthew has some parts of it. Luke also has some parts of it. But that short gospel called Mark's gospel has it in the most clear sense among the three gospels that tells us that when he tells the story, when Mark the gospel writer tells the story, he's telling a coronation story. Running from chapter 1 right until the end, his theme is the coronation of a different kind of king that you have never seen in the history of Israel. So that's where he's coming from. So, he has all the elements of a coronation. There is the announcer, the trophies of war, the king's vehicle, uh, the, the, the thing that carries the king, the crown of the king and the throne of the king. And we will run through them from now on. So the announcer, he needs an announcer. Mark, the right gospel writer, knows that if I'm going to talk about the coronation, there must be somebody to go and announce this king that is coming. So he quoted from Isaiah 40. Remember last week when I spoke to you about Isaiah 40, I said that Isaiah 40 to 55 is one single passage or Treat, should be treated as one single passage because it's about a set of prophecies. And the context was this. <coughs> king Cyrus has now become the king of the empire. So his policy was to release all those who are exiled in his realm to go back to their homeland. It's a very smart strategy because that will cause peace to come to the kingdom instead of this, uh, discontent and dissatisfaction so that there will be peace in his kingdom. So he said to all the Jews who had been in his Babylonian kingdom for the last 70 years, now you go back home. You can go back home. I told you some of the reasons why they did not want to go back home because of different reasons. But the prophet Isaiah was telling them, when you want to go back home, it is not just going home. Yes, there is a throne in Judah. But remember, the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, was transported from Judah all the way to Babylon, tied as a prisoner. And all his sons were brought also to Babylon. And then the king of Babylon killed all his sons in front of him. Then plucked out his two eyes. That was the last king of Israel, of Judah. After that, there's no more king because there's no more heirs. All the children were all killed before his very eyes. They say, if we go back to Jerusalem, if we go back to Judah to rebuild the city, there's no king. But Isaiah, in a subtle way, sends out this message, 
where you got no physical king, but going ahead, he's now he's using the announcer way, the announcer who's announcing the coronation. Prepare ye the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So Mark picks it up. Can put John put the words in the mouth of John Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the path straight. See, so that in Isaiah, they know that they are not going to have a physical king, but the king is the Lord Himself. And now Mark picks it up and say, you are also going to hear the story of a coronation. And it's the story of Jesus as the king. Prepare the way of the Lord. I am the announcer that is doing the job that Isaiah or one of the people who call out, prepare the way of the Lord. So he also needs to have trophies of war. Now, or evidences, or credentials. We we'll use this word, credentials. In, in Jesus' story, in Mark's story, he's not going to talk about his victory over this king or that king. The various miracles and parables and stories in the Mark's gospel represent the victory of this king Jesus. In this case, they are the enemies of God. Some of them are not, but some of them are to give him credential as a king. So there are victory over the demons when he cast out demons. So there's victory over sickness like he lay hands on Peter's mother-in-law and cast out that fever. So he fought against the legalism of the Pharisees because the Pharisees bind people rather than liberate people. We talk about the Sabbath. He said, you all make men to be subject to Sabbath when the Lord make men, when they make, men, make Sabbath for men. So he had conquered storms and waves. He walked on water. He multiplied bread and wine, eh, bread and fishes. He turned water into wine. He did all those miracles as credentials, but they are there to vindicate him, to say that he is the king. But the climax of it all is the Mount of Transfiguration, where the voice of the Father said of Jesus, This is my Son, listen to Him. What greater credential can you get for a king? God the Almighty Himself gave Him the credential that day. And from that day onwards, He was free to tell the path of his mission on life, which was to go to the cross and die for many, and on the third day, he will rise again. Before that, he could not tell the disciples this part. But when he was given that final, ultimate vindication by the Father, the credential from the Father, that is so unmistakably clear that this is the Son of God, there is no need to stop, no need to hold back the final part of the message, which is that I will go to the cross, I will die for the sins of all men, and then on the third day, I will rise again. He needs a vehicle. We know the vehicle he used. It was a donkey, a coat. And they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. He came in a, a donkey. A donkey, some commentators have said, a donkey is usually used for someone poor or lowly. But some people say some kings ride on donkeys. Well, I'm not so sure how to make sense of that. But definitely, he came as a donkey in a way very different from other kings. It shows the humility of the king. Now, as he approached Jerusalem, I show you the Old Testament part. This is the the other part of the Psalm 118 that I did not quote. In verse, in verse 25, I put them side by side so that you can see in Psalm 118, verse 25, the crowd shout, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. So you find that 
they were saying, save us. Which in the original Hebrew is Hosanna. So the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. As he entered into Jerusalem gates. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10 of Mark's gospel, chapter 11. He said, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. See, this is how Mark is trying to make you think that the coronation verses apply to Jesus now. And when you come to that part, blessed is he who comes in. Or oh, blessed is the coming on kingdom of our father David. You know, Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So, you see how the link is made by Mark. Of course, he needs a crown. And they crown, they clothe him in a purple robe, a purple cloak, twisting together a crown of thorns. And they put it on him. That was the crown he had. Not like the picture I showed you at the first slide. Glittering jewelry, precious stones, expensive gold. But it just what we call a crown made of thorns. And immediately after that, in verse 18, they salute him. What mockery there is. You can see in their twisted lips when they say, Hail, King of the Jews! It's just a chasm to his height. They say, This is the king. Hey, Mark picks that up. Mark is trying to tell you, yeah, I'm talking about a coronation, but it's a totally different kind of coronation. Again, I show you two verses side by side. And they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of a skull. And they crucified him there. See, I think many people will say that his throne was not a real physical throne, but the cross itself. Remember, Golgotha is a small little hill outside Jerusalem. It's a, see, that's why he ascended that hill. It's higher than other pieces of land because Jesus to say, this king is above all. But you know, in that, it's that spiritual sense that you've got to capture it. This king is not going to come with regalia, with, you know, expensive uh, jewelry, but a crown made of thorns, a throne made of wood in the shape of a cross. But I also think that in heaven, the enthronement or the crowning, where he comes to the, he comes to the throne, is of a different sort. It's Psalm 110 verses 1 to 2. When he it didn't take place at Calvary, but it's after Calvary, when he went up into heaven and reached the, the threshold of heaven where the throne room of God is, he heard the voice of the Father say, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. See, that's the enthronement. Where does God sit? He sits on the throne. So now he enthrones his son at his right hand. Until I make your enemies your footstool. Verse 2. The Lord says, sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. See, scepter is one of the paraphernalia of a king. One of the equipment that the king and enthronement is, which is involved in enthronement. Rule in the midst of the enemies. That's your king. He rules in, not in the physical realm of lands. He rules in the heart. Romans 14, 17 say the kingdom of God, where the rule of God is, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's where he's saying rule in the midst of your people. Rule in the midst of your enemies. 
not in the notes there, but in Psalm 68, verses 17 to 18. This is again people's, uh, some commentators view that this could be again a coronation passage. Verse 17, the chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. See, part of the fun, <laughs> part of the, the thing about coronation is you need large crowds. The larger the crowd, the more exciting it is. It captures the people's attention. If you are coronated and there are only the people the size of this room, go and hail our king, hail the king, hail the king, they will say, what kind of measly king are you? You rule only so few people. So the crowds must be big. So the writers say the chariots of God are twice 10,000. It is not 20,000, no, it's 10,000 times 10,000. <laughs> That's how many people that is coming to greet the king and cheer him. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. Uh, watch this in verse 18, which is actually quoted in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 onwards. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train. See, that is part of his uh, credentials. All the captives in his train. That means all those people whom he has captured as, a, as king on the earth here. And receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious that the Lord God may dwell there. And then Paul picks it up and says, when he ascended, he gave gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Because part of this whole thing about coronation is that when you rise to the throne, you bless your people with gifts. I think when Queen Elizabeth was crowned, there were a certain group of people, many, many people, uh, they all either get a postcard or some little gift to commemorate the occasion that this Elizabeth now is queen over the realm. I believe that Psalms and throne is a little bit more interesting, isn't it? I think we all have to reckon the fact that he has to go through the cross and then now he is now thrown in heaven. This year we do not have our watch night service. If you are a regular visitor to that watch night service, we particularly make it a point to go past midnight because then we will start the new year. And it is our tradition here, which we did not do this year because of the restrictions. We would like you to dedicate your life, your year to the Lord. To pause and to give your year, hand over your year to the Lord. Hopefully, that is not just a mechanical thing but really a dedication of your heart from your will. Also part of that tradition, instead of writing resolutions, I always recommend you write a letter to Jesus so that next year when you look at the letter, you see what you have said to him, some of the things you complain to him, you thank him that's no longer there, and some of the things that you feel very bad about, you know, God has resolved for you, and things you promise to do for him, you read that letter back again, you see how much you have passed or you have failed in trying to do the will of God. And those are things that we do as we crossed over uh, to a new year. So this year we don't have, I'm telling you about the coronation of a king, because with or without watch night service, he's still king, he still wants your year, he wants your commitment to him. So this verse is very appropriate from Psalm 110. Your people will, when he said, the Lord, say to my Lord, sit down at my right hand and rule over your enemy. He say now in verse 3, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments on the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. So as I said, we find in the records of the Old Testament in the fifth year of King Ahab, or this fellow, or Jehoshaphat, or Rehoboam, 
every new year, probably some kind of a reactment of a crowning or an enthronement or a coronation takes place. So, in the new year, even though there is a coronavirus, we all need to crown him for a fresh year. That he be king again. That righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost will become more clear to us. That we will do like what Jesus said, do, he did in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 4. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There is a work of God prepared by God in the portion that is the size of 2021. Then you take the will of God and do what He requires of you in 2021. 2020 is over already. You can't do backdated work for God. You can only do this year's work for Him. You can't do 2022's work, okay? You can only do 2021's work. When Moses, and Moses is, wrote only one psalm, Psalm 90. He talked about the eternity of God and the shortness of man's life. And he's so aware that there's eternity and I have this short lifespan. And he cried out, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know who's wise? It's not people who that just with a lot of head knowledge. Wise people are people who do the will of God. That's all. You do the will of God, you are very wise already. So when we look at that, to be wise in the year is to do the will of God. That's uh, the end of Psalm 90 will say, show us your work. It's not show just to terrify your enemies, but show your work so that I can know how to understand to do my work. Because I want to follow your work. But the key thing in Psalm 110 verse 3 is that the people are willing. And, you know, we have to deal with that at the heart level. So many things are beyond our control in the year to come. We cannot control the external things. And I don't think anyone here tries to do that. I mean, there is a limit to what you can do and you should do. But no one really can control but we can control the internal things of our life, our will, isn't it? We can submit that to the will of God. We can make the work of God our food for the next 363 days. Not 365. We lost, we, we have passed two days already. So in the next 363 days, we can do something about the will of God and take that as our food. As some say, we need to be willing to offer ourselves freely, voluntarily. No one can compel you. But God's word can compel you. So we can't do much about what's going on outside of us. As I always say, COVID means Christ overcomes virus, infection and depression. So he alone, from it, working from our heart, will be able to do that. It's not so much a question of you know, ignoring the outside, eh, uh, yeah, ignoring the external, but paying more attention on the inside. Are we willing? Willing is a matter of our heart. So there's no what we call um, watch night service. But we'll do what we do in watch night service. We don't write letters la, in this particular Sunday. But we just want you to hand over the year to him. Crown him Crown him as the king. Let his kingdom come more and more. And righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost will be our portion. Shall we pray? This morning we want to bow ourselves before the word, Lord. The word of the king. The king rules. Mark the gospel tell, teller wants to us to know. The whole coronation process of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we thank you that you went to the cross. You died for us. And there's so much evidence to show that you are the true King. 
Because the final word is the Father's word to you. Sit down at the, my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And he gave you a mighty scepter to rule in the midst of our enemies. We don't want to be your enemy, Lord, because then you will overcome us. We want to be your friend. John's gospel told us you will call us friends. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. All our past, all that is not right in year 2020, that we are involved with, that we contribute, we sin against you. We ask that you cover that by the blood. With the forgiveness of sins, Lord, there's hope for a new life, for hope for a new year. Then our year will be truly new year, Lord. Not just because of the calendar, but because of the blood of Jesus that can cover our past and give us a new beginning. In this beginning of Sunday, of, all, of the Sundays in this year, we ask you, come, your kingdom come, your will be done. Then give us bread, bread of your will, bread of your presence, bread of Jesus every day, Lord. We submit our hearts to you. Help us to be willing, Lord. Help us not hold back, but help us to give you fully our will and all that is in our life. We will be eager volunteers in the kingdom of God. Help us not to look at our own weaknesses, but to look at your call for us. And so I pray for everyone who hears me this morning, both online and in this room and elsewhere, I pray for your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives. We submit all that is going to take place in our lives and around our lives and in this church in the year 2021 into your hands. We ask you to work out your will and your word and your work for us, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.